going to be exciting. Just what we wanted. Here in St. Louis, let's do it. It will be his 52nd overall win. Is that familiar sign? Levi Kitchen. Can anybody say clean sweep? That trick, brother. And he's done it. Eli Thomas back on top. Yeah, welcome to another episode. It's SMX Insider. I'm on the road. I'm in a hotel in Manhattan, in New York City. But we have a week off. But we have a lot to discuss with the Jasons, Wygant, and Thomas. I want to start with the very feel-good Eli Tomac win, JT. What does this mean going forward? Is this just a cool little fairy tale story? Hey, Eli got one more win. Or do you think this can indicate more wins, maybe more seasons, a greater future for Tomac just notching this one? Yeah, I think it's the latter. Uh, I think we saw him building towards this. And you have to go back to Arlington and Daytona to find this level for Eli again. And then he drops that bombshell on us that he's had a twisted ankle for the last couple of weeks. Well, maybe let us know that. That information would have been great to have. Uh, but anyway, I do think it leans to him having fun, him believing that he can get back to the level of winning again, which is the most important factor in deciding whether he races not only the Pro Motocross Championship, but being here again in 2025. Now, look, we have to acknowledge, as awesome as it was that Eli won this race, there were some other circumstances happening out on the track as he and Jet Lawrence were supposed to have a showdown in the final St. Louis Triple Crown with one, two, two, one scores. Uh, JT, I try to stay out of block pass rough riding opinions because I've never been out there in one of those corners like you have. I think people wanted to string up Justin Barsha as soon as they saw that for the first time, but you really dug in. And you do not feel it is a 100% Barsha, why are you doing this? You believe there was a reasonable explanation as to what happened between Lawrence and Barsha. Yeah, I think there's some blame to pass around amongst all the parties here. And unfortunately, it was just a sequence of events that could not have gone any worse, in my opinion. And I really tried to do a good job on the SMX post race show of breaking that down with visual examples, standing in the corner. And I spent a good 10 minutes just staring at the turn. I went back to the corner before, looked at the entry angles, what everybody had to be thinking in that moment. And I, I simply don't believe that Justin Barsha went in there with bad intent. Now you could say he made a bad decision and he should have been more aware. And I would also say the same thing for Jet Lawrence. He should have been more aware of what could go wrong there. Uh, but in the end, I do believe it was a racing incident. And I don't think this was what Justin Barsha had drawn up as he entered that corner. Okay, we have so much to get to in this show. It's kind of good that we have a weekend off because there's so much to digest from AMA penalties with the whole Red Cross situation that affected multiple riders. Again, we'll get deeper into the Barsha Lawrence scenario. We'll look at points both in Monster Energy, AMA Supercross, and the SMX playoffs. We even have track maps to show you for the playoff races in 24 for the first time. But we're going to start this with some really big news. Adam Cianciarulo has something to say. He shared time with us as well as on his own Plugged In podcast about his racing future. Yeah, so big news. The big news is I am retiring from uh, professional racing at the conclusion of Supercross this year. Salt Lake City will be my last race. Uh, it's, of course, it's it's a bittersweet moment for me um, because you guys know I, I love racing. I, I love the sport. Um, but from a health standpoint, for me, um, I have basically as I've talked about here and there, I have a nerve injury that is kind of related to some of my earlier um, earlier injuries with my shoulder dislocations. It's basically, it's called the brachial plexus. It sits at the top of the shoulder. Nerve endings go down and control a lot of the, what's going on with your hand. Um, and basically those nerves got really stretched out and, and damaged along the way. And it has been Progressively getting worse. It started in the end of 2019 and it's kind of been progressively getting worse since um, And it's also it's kind of it's put me on the ground a lot too like with my hand slipping off the handlebar and It's caused me a lot of other injuries as well um, I think I've had 10 or 12 different procedures different surgeries to, to try to get it fixed um, And at this point, I think the, the best I can do is just is just rest it and and um, 
yeah, it's it's bittersweet, like I said, but I have fought and done everything that that's in my control. Um, I feel really proud of, of what I've done and kind of this year, uh, starting the year, it was kind of getting a little bit worse in the off season, and I started the year and, and kind of realized that, um, it, you know, it wasn't I wasn't going to be up to the level that I I think um, is kind of productive for me, I guess, or or worth the risk. So I saw that I was kind of capped out, you know, where I was, and I think it's the perfect time to to move on. Having time to to kind of reflect on on my career, of course, there's too many highlights that that come to my mind. Um, my amateur career was was great, and I had a lot of really really good races and experiences there. And, and with Mitch and his uh, you know pro circuit Kawasaki program, um, winning the 2019 uh, motocross championship was, I think, probably the proudest moment of my career, especially coming off of Supercross, kind of heartbreaking fashion losing the losing the uh, championship there at the last race and and kind of coming back and doing that that was great and really it's it's just the, the whole journey who it's made me I feel like I've had to rebuild myself uh, many times throughout the inevitable highs and lows of of this sport and um, I just feel so grateful to to have been a part of it you know I, I've always loved this I always will love it and you know, to, to be able to say I kind of won races at, you know, at every level, um, accomplished a lot of things that uh, a lot a lot of people don't get to. You know, just a just a kid from Orlando, Florida, and um, to be sitting here today with a solid 10-year career under my belt in the pro ranks, man, it's I'm really proud. Of course, with this announcement, uh, I've you know I've been thinking about where I go from here. I'm. 27 years old and I still, you know, I want to contribute to the sport. I mean, I want to be in the sport and in the industry. There's nothing else I would rather do. Um, obviously, it's not going to, it's going to be in a different capacity, not as a rider. And I'm not quite sure what that looks like yet. I originally starting the year, I was planning on at least finishing out the year. And, you know, I thought I had until October to kind of iron these things out but um, with everything happening so fast we we don't have a exact um an exact plan but i know i, I have my podcast of course plugged in um, i'm going to be uh, creating a bunch of content on social media and you know my dream is to be one of the voices of supercross one day you know i think i uh, have a very unique experience in in the sport and um, I love being around it. I love talking about it. And I look forward to, um, you know, being able to highlight how great these athletes are. To me, this is the worst part of sports. Uh, this is a guy who had all the talent, uh, had all the tools, wanted it in the worst way, wanted to be a star. I think we wanted him to be a star because he was such a good guy. And sometimes sports just doesn't work out that way. And honestly, JT, it's always the same reason. It's injuries, and it's just a bummer that it turned out this way. Yeah, Adam's a rider I've been watching since he was five years old, and uh, he grew up about an hour and a half away from me, so I've gotten to see not only most of his amateur career, but of course his pro career as well. And one of the nicest guys and one of the most well-spoken intellectual riders that I've, I've ever come across. Uh, so wherever he lands, he's gonna be successful, but it is a shame that he, you know, you could always argue that he didn't reach his potential, then again, he was a 250 national champion, and there's a lot of success that he that he shared. And I think that's the way I'll remember is, him, is how well he rode on a motorcycle, not maybe some of the shortcomings. I think we kind of knew this was coming, but not maybe right here, right now. There's certainly a lot more we can talk about with Sean Cerullo, the career that he did have going forward. But let's get to some other news involving him. We thought the big Sean Cerullo news would be his mechanic, Justin Shanty, who about a month ago started asking me about real estate in North Carolina. Turns out he has a job with Toyota Racing Development in their NASCAR side and mostly working with, I think, the JGR NASCAR team. So St. Louis will be his last race in this sport. And unfortunately, Adam really didn't get to race much, but uh, Justin was always a cool character with Adam and also his days with Joey Savacci. So we'll miss him on this circuit. 
Yeah, it's, it's hard to really think negatively of this because he's moving on to a great situation. This is something he chose to do. So I think everybody's very happy for him. It's, it's our loss, not his. Uh, and, and yeah, it's going to be unfortunate to not see him in the pits every single weekend. All right, JT, we've reached that time in the program. Now break this down as you did. You actually went down to the racetrack after the race to look at the corner where Farsha hit Lawrence. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's the widest corner that I could ever remember in Monster Energy Supercross. So let's start there, right? And when you have a corner that's this wide, you can see the drone shot there. That means that you're gonna get multiple entry angles. And this corner specifically had a double apex. You can see the berm right there on the outside. That is the, the exit point where Justin Barsha was headed to. That was not the exit point that Jet Lawrence was using. So thinking about it that way, there's two different ways for those guys to come into that corner. And I think that's where both riders are a little bit to blame. You know, if Jet, if you're using that outside entry point gonna cut down, you have to always be thinking, okay, who's on my inside? Who could be putting me into a very precarious spot here? especially on the first lap. And if you're Justin Barsha and the lead rider is on that outside, you have to be prepared for them to cut down. And when Justin Barsha carries that much speed and that much momentum into a corner, that disallows him from really any maneuverability whatsoever. Now he had Vince Freezy behind him. He was really worried about, I think, any sort of walk pass that was coming his way. But when you really think about who's to blame here, that's where I land on a little bit of both because that awareness factor has to be the pre predominant thought on the first lap. You just have to assume that there's, there's a rider to your right, to your left, and right behind you at all times on that first lap. Gotcha. Okay, and that's not the only controversial thing in the night. So we had a red cross flag at the finish line jump. Came out as the white flag came out, was still out when the checkers came out. A lot of riders penalized. The highest profile is Lawrence because they took away his win in race two, but also Cooper Webb. Jason Anderson did it twice just so Jason Anderson to get double A and A penalties where everybody else only had one. Uh, but I was pretty outspoken. You and I do a podcast on uh, Sunday night and I feel like they can't just put these flags out and say, hey, it's up to you to see them. I feel like they need to talk to the riders and say, what can we do to make these easier to see? Now, Jed is gesturing there that he wants it to be waived. The reason they don't waive it is because riders in the past have said, when you wave it, we cannot see the red cross part the flag gets furled up. So that's why they just hold it and not wave it. I get that. But I'm thinking at least maybe a yellow flag before the red cross so they at least know to start looking around. And JT, the tunnel vision you have on the track, how easy is it to always see everything at all times? Yeah, this was a really unfortunate circumstance here because you think about they're waving a white flag also, right? So that's going to naturally get their attention, not a static neutral red flag that's hanging there. So if they see anything, they're likely to see the white flag. And it was also moving away from the, their natural eye movement. The, the track was flowing to the left, the way that corner exited, they almost had to look back to their right to see any of that. So you think about their peripheral vision is all they're leaning on there. If they don't necessarily notice that medic flag out of the peripheral vision, they're not gonna see it at all. So it was a really tough situation, of course, Jet didn't mean to put anyone in harm's way or, you know, violate a rule. Um, but in the end, several riders did, which should tell you how difficult it was. When you have five riders that are penalized and once one rider twice. Uh, that just speaks to how difficult it was to see this. And this weekend in St. Louis, we got the return of SMX next. These riders are the riders we'll be talking about for the next decade and to see their talent developing was pretty evident and drew adams was simply on fire remember he was your winner in daytona and i kind of thought he was the class of the field all day and he had to work through the pack i also thought that landon gibson really kind of showed up and he was very disappointed after daytona but this runner-up finish he's barely 15 years old drew adams just turned 16 on sunday after st louis this bodes well for the future of the sport, and that is the goal. Give these riders a chance to develop, show what they can do, so when they do move up to the pro class, they're much more developed and much more prepared. Yeah, and I think it also helps the fans get to know these names a little better. Maybe they've heard of these riders here and there, but they haven't actually seen them. I think when you're deep in the industry like us, you think that a lot of these things are known, but until you put them on Peacock, in front of the fans, on Saturday night, People don't know, necessarily know what they're dealing with. So I feel like names like Cole Davies, now Gibson you mentioned, Revan Gordon was up there, Gavin Towers. There's a lot of names that have now become recognizable, which hopefully will make them bigger stars when they do move 
into the pro ranks. A long way off from that could be another generation of Dungies. Now, it's a little justice served. So Jay Dungey, who is Aaron Plessinger's mechanic and also Ryan Dungey's brother, his son was scheduled to race KTM Juniors at San Diego. That got rained out. They let all the riders, not just Dungey, get another KTM Junior race in. He got into the Dome at St. Louis. No mud problems there. Always fun when you get to see these uh, racers within a racing family stories. And even wearing the number seven, like Plessinger JT. Well, yeah, and this is uh, truly a motocross family here. You think about the legacy, and, and Jay Dungey continues that each weekend with Aaron Plessinger. But I hate to tell you, uh, little Liam Dungey here has some pretty big shoes to fill from his uncle, but that's okay. He's got a lot of time to uh, to figure that out. And it wouldn't be cool. Wouldn't it be cool if we saw him in that SMX Next program and then eventually turn pro. Another person, a personality that was there this weekend, he wasn't participating like Liam Dungey was, but Jonathan Owens made an appearance, uh, just signed a new contract with Chicago Bears. Remember, he's also the husband of Olympian Simone Biles. So there's a lot of tie in here, but it was awesome to spend some time and talk with him. He was a big fan of this, right? And you, we get to meet all sorts of celebrities. Some are into it, some not. He was very, very much into it. You can judge by the excitement level. And I think it's really cool the way he's able to give back to his foundations. He brought a lot of youngsters out, as you saw video of there, but uh, just a really cool crossover and to see athlete versus athlete and the respect between the two is always a lot of fun. Yeah, we've seen a lot of crossover. We had an MLB pitcher on the show earlier in the year, for example, but I don't know if we've seen them then incorporate their charitable foundation in. So he had kids that had really good grades come and walk the track with their families on Friday. Then he had 75 kids total at the race on Saturday, just giving them something to watch that's cool. It wasn't football, it was Supercross. We're down with it. That's cool that he was, and he stopped by Race Day Live, hung out with Dan Hubbard and Justin Brayton as well. So uh, that was really cool for him to do that, and we wish him luck. He's a St. Louis native, that's why he did this, even though he'll be playing uh, for the Chicago Bears when the NFL season begins. Now, you add all this up, there was so much going on from celebrity appearances to penalties and riders crashing into each other and Eli Tomac, a super popular win. Oh, yeah, we also had the Triple Crown Championship on the line. Cooper Webb ends up scoring the most points in the Triple Crown races this year. I don't know what to mean in a normal year how much this means, but I do think it means something this year. To me, when you take these nine short races together, three events in total, doesn't this kind of prove the consistency of Cooper Webb? In my mind, this is a little symbolic about how his season has gone. Yeah, it's it really leans into his racecraft and the way he goes about things. You know, there's really no sudden movement, right? He's always there at the end, kind of finds his way to the front as he proved to us in Seattle. You know, Clinton Fowler did a great job of breaking down that start, but that is so emblematic of what he does. And he kind of sneaks up on you at the end of the night. You're not really thinking about it. He's not the... You know, the headline grabbing guy in between each of the races on the Triple Crown night. And then there he is. He's your Triple Crown champion at the end of all of this. And Cooper Webb has to be excited not only about the Triple Crown championship, but he made up more points. And that's what we've been talking about. Can he bring the number down? It got all the way to 21. And ever since then, it's gone to 16 and now 8. We are back to the single digits and right where Cooper Webb wanted to be. Just get to the end of the series within striking distance. And we each... Here we are. Yeah, you keep saying Jet Lawrence riding well, but don't let them hang around. And Cooper Webb's hanging around. Unfortunately, though, kind of forgotten in all the stuff that happened. Look at Chase Sexton. It's a golden opportunity to make up points. He got caught early when Mitchell Oldenburg went flipping through a rhythm lane in the first race. And I often judge a rider's night based on how extensive the quote they give to their team is in the post-race PR. If it's really short, it means the guy didn't want to talk to anyone, not even his own team. And basically, all Sexton said was, I'm ready for a weekend off. So not what he needed after almost winning that race in Seattle. He needed to get maybe within 15 or 10 points, and he could have if St. Louis went a little better. It might be down to just Webb and Jed at this point. And more points to talk about, which is our playoffs. We had so much fun last year looking at the playoff bubble. Those riders 15 to 20, trying to make it in, guaranteed, not having to go to the LCQ. And I look at this group here, and here's what's interesting. We don't even know how many of these guys are going to race for motocross. Jorge Prado, we assume, is not going to race in America until next year. Dean Wilson, can he make his way back from injury? He wants to. Benny Bloss, Beta, has said right now they're only going to race Supercross, but they might do select pro motocross rounds. 
Justin Hill is back to being the mystery Justin Hill this year. I don't know what to make of this group, JT, and who's going to be in the top 20. It's a pretty wild bunch. Yeah, trying to make predictions right now is a fool's errand, but it's going to be fantastic to watch all of this. It's fluid, right? And, and all those variables that you mentioned are going to play out over the next several months. We'll get into pro motocross and remember all the suspense at the last couple of rounds about who's in and who's out. Uh, it's so great to kind of have a, a sneak peek of what that's going to be like and kind of follow it early this year. Oh, we have not even, I can't believe we've gone this far. We've not even covered the 250 class because there was so much to talk about. Uh, but there's really only one thing to talk about in that division and it's what is going on with Levi Kitchen? What has gotten into this guy? What a breakout season it has been for Levi Kitchen. And remember, just because he only has 17 races in the books in Monster Energy Supercross, he's 23 years old. So he's developed. I think he has the mental maturity to be in this situation now. And he is very aware that he has taken control of this series. And I, ha I had the opportunity to sit next to Mitch Payton on the flight home on Sunday. And both of us agreed that Levi's doing it effortlessly. He's not taking big risks. He doesn't look like he's riding over his head. And things are just clicking. And that's a really powerful thing because most of these guys in this class seem like they're taking a lot of risk to win that is not the feeling that i'm getting from levi kitchen he looks like he's in his comfort zone which is a very dangerous thing to everybody not named levi kitchen all right so that's kitchen and the guys in the west let's update you on 250 east because they will be racing when we return from our break which will be in foxborough massachusetts here are the standings it is so close between mcadoo and vial pierce brown quietly is still in it even without a podium Hayden Deegan's not out, out, uh, down 16 points, you see there. I feel like, JT, McAdoo's kind of becoming the feel-good story. I feel like, internally, if you're not personally involved with any rider in this championship, I think people want to see McAdoo get this done just because all he's been through, and not just this season, his whole career. So it'll be interesting to see if he can ride that wave, because I think there's a real vibe here for McAdoo at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's hard to not cheer for Cameron McAdoo, but I really believe that this 250 East series is going to see a big shakeup. I don't think Hayden Deegan is done with this thing. We haven't even seen the best from Pierce Brown yet. We haven't really seen him at the front at all. And you look back and you see him hanging around in this championship. And the biggest variable of all for me is that we're gonna have these two showdown events. And you think about the mix of talent, the way these points can really kind of go all over the place, right? One good race, one bad race from one of the key guys and everything changes. So. I'm still super excited about the way this 250 East shakes up and you think about the races coming down the road and what that could do to this championship. Okay, so this is interesting. I'm already picturing this feel-good title for Cameron McAdoo, but you're saying, look out, could be more to come from Hayden Deegan. Yeah, I think with the showdown races and the opportunity and points there, plus I don't think we've seen the best version of Hayden Deegan that we will in this championship yet. So he's got a lot of pressure on him. He's 16 points down but I do think there is winning in his future. And we know that this class can be so chaotic and the picture can flip upside down very, very quickly. Ooh, wow, that's that's gonna be exciting when we go back to Foxborough, but let's go further out. All right, JT, we saw the track maps for the playoffs. What are you thinking when we start to look at Charlotte, Texas, and Las Vegas? Well, I think the themes remain the same. You, you think about Charlotte and the way that Z-Max Dragway is, the track goes the opposite direction, but the starts are very similar. You have that split start, and I think we'll see the same dynamics of play, that same type of dirt, but everybody won't be as surprised as they were last year about the outdoor hybrid style, and, and they'll I think they'll be much closer on their bike setups, which will help all of them think about how far off Jet Lawrence was last year. I don't think that will be the case again. Uh, transitioning to Texas Motor Speedway, it feels a lot like Daytona when I look at the track map. Now, the dirt will be much different. We know that. But the layout, the way the corners are, the way the jumps are set up, it has that Daytona type vibe. And then we go on to Las Vegas. We keep going west. We go to Las Vegas for the finale. You think about September, the dirt's going to be really dry, really hard, probably pretty windy. So it's going to be like a Southern California test track when the track's just completely blown out. So it'll be a new dynamic, something these guys will have to think about way ahead of time but a very, very different style of racetrack between all three. And I think the conditions for the track will be very different between all three.
Okay, SMX facts time. Let's bring in our statistician, Clinton Fowler. We're going to talk SMX playoffs. We have track maps. We have dates, locations for all these rounds. But who is going to be racing? And actually, Clinton, this illustrates how wide open our 450 Supercross campaign has been this year. Probably more winners than some people anticipated. There, there might be a few more than I had anticipated. I'll have to admit on that. It may be double what I had anticipated. Um, and there are six guys that have won, and they get an automatic LCQ bid into the, the SMX finals. And so Jet Lawrence, Cooper Webb, Chase Sexton, Eli Tomac, Ken Roxon, Aaron Plessinger, all in automatic on LCQ bids. So not top 20, but LCQ. So pretty good, pretty good for them. JT, you got to ask the question, is there anybody else that could get this automatic LCQ bid? Well, yeah, it's, if we can find somebody that can win a race. Um, I think Jason Anderson still could find a way, and it doesn't seem likely. It seems like he's kind of fallen off the back here, but the way these things go, end of the season, maybe some motivation's a little lower. He's going into some of his best racetracks of Denver and Salt Lake City. So, yeah, I, that, if you're looking for one name, that's one I would point to. All right, go to the 250 class again. Yes, if you win a race, you get an automatic bid. So what does that look like? Yeah, on the 250 side, God, guys, we've had eight winners in 12 rounds. Absolutely incredible parity amongst all the riders there. Levi Kitchen with the most there with three wins. And then RJ Hampshire and Tom Vial each have two wins. So those guys are all in. And then Forkner, Cameron McAdoo, Hayden Deegan, Jordan Smith, Nate Thrasher, all automatic LCQ bids, all directly in there. And I think there's still a couple of guys on, on the bubble here that could win. JT, who do you pick on, out of those guys? Yeah, I think I think Seth Hamaker has the speed to do it, right? He's going to need to get the start. He's going to need to ride mistake free. And another name that no one is thinking about that's sitting there third in points is Pierce Brown. He's been riding incredibly well. Now, his starts are atrocious, and he would be the first one to tell you that. But if you told me that Pierce finally got a hole shot and was like, yeah, I just put it all together. It wouldn't shock me. This class is set up for that type of variance right now. You just have to be in the right place at the right time. So top 20 are automatically into the races. They don't have to use the LCQ. So let's look at that field a little bit and how you think that could go this year, Clinton. Yeah, we. I think the, the cutoff point for the top 20 in the 450s is going to be 155 points. That's adjusting for this slight change in Supercross points this year to align with Pro Motocross. Um, right now, that puts the top seven in the points. So all the way to, from Jeff Lawrence to Jason Anderson as what I think is already an automatic bid into the top 20. And if anything, if it's just like last year, then I would expect the top 10 of the Supercross guys to make it in. The important piece here, that leaves 10 spots of automatic bid open going into pro motocross. There's a lot of variability there, JT, and a lot of opportunity for guys to jump into those slots. Yeah, there's a lot of racing left. You think about what we have still in this Monster Energy Supercross Championship, the Pro Motocross Championship. This is gonna be a moving target for a lot of these riders. Some of the 450 riders are still racing 250 Supercross. The aforementioned Phil Nicoletti will move into the 450 class and try to jump into this top 20 from points he gains in that series alone. So it's gonna be something we're gonna to have to keep our eye on. Some of the riders, you know, like Benny Bloss, if he doesn't race the entire Pro Motocross Championship, does he put himself into jeopardy going into that playoff series as far as having to go to those LCQs each week? Uh, I think every, you know, opportunity is on the table, but you're gonna have to keep, you know, you're just gonna be able to take a break during the summer and forget about your placing here. You're gonna have to keep an eye on it. So let's get to the same exercise here in the 250s. Yeah, in the 250s, we, 152 points is that cutoff point, or what I think is going to be that cutoff point. And again, maybe people notice how much dollars is on the line. What Colt Nichols did last year, and we see a few more people show up, and maybe these lines go up. But right now, my guess is it's 152 points for the 250 riders. At the moment, there's only one rider that's automatically in there and above that line, which is Levi Kitchen, who we've seen last weekend sweep that Triple Crown, having an incredible season. Nobody else is in there, but I expect by the end of the season, the top five in the 250s will have a top 20 automatic bid and be locked in there. And again, JT, 
that leaves 15 slots and a whole heck of a lot of racing going into pro motocross. Yeah, and I'll tell you this, we're, we're gonna watch again and, and there's gonna be a lot of moving around as this all shakes out. But to me, for Austin Forkner, if he is worried about getting in through LCQs, the way he was riding, the way he was getting starts, to me, that's not a, it's not a non-starter event for him. I think he could come out of this injury, prepare himself all summer long. Maybe he makes some pro motocross championship races, maybe not. But I think the way this is set up, you could see a, a, a dark horse like Austin Forkner be a real factor. And yes, he's going to have some things to overcome, bad gate picks. But if he's on the form we last saw him on before he crashed in Arlington, watch out. He could be a real player come September. Uh, it probably seems too early to be thinking about this, but Clinton, I feel like we learned last year it's never too early. This stuff matters. Yeah, I mean, you, you want to accumulate those points now. It's gonna, it'll pay off down the road, and and I think especially for that top twenty line, that becomes the critical one. You you don't want to have to run every one of those three LCQs during the SMX finals. All right, that's what we're gonna keep our eye on as uh, we head into Pro Motocross coming up in May. Thanks, Clinton. See you in Foxborough. Great to chat, guys. Going to wrap this up, a well-earned spring break for everyone, not just myself. Uh, we will not have a race this upcoming weekend. Racing returns Foxborough on April 13th, and you can watch Race Day Live at 1.30 and racing at 7 o'clock. That is all Eastern time on Peacock. And let's think about our show next week. We got an idea. We're going to do the not top 10. We're going to pick the 10, can I call them lowlights, JT, to talk about on our show next Thursday? Uh, it was some of the most exciting moments, but also I think some of the moments we'd like to have back if you want to look at it that way. Yeah, that's both uh, for our stuff internally in the broadcast. That's for racing out on the track. For example, yes, we will be mentioning the Monster Girl out on the track with Cooper Webb a couple of weeks ago. That's an example of what you're going to hear us talk about at our next show. So don't miss it. Thanks for watching SMX Insider. And if you want to catch us in person, go to Foxborough, April 13th. Should be a fun one.